thanks very much. Um, I've been asked to talk to you about uh, knowledge indicators and databases. And so I, I, I guess I'm, and he's just left, so I can say this, I guess I've been asked to, to see if I can outdo Bob Watson in terms of a, of a more boring talk. But no, I, <coughs> um, <laughs> we'll see. And we'll, and, and we'll um, I'll let you be the judge of that, of course, and you'll let me know over lunch, I'm sure. Okay, so um, uh, something about biodiversity monitoring. This is important because we're talking about the state of the planet and how we can get to some sort of sustainability and some sort of um, uh, uh, hopeful future when actually we know the trends are, uh, trends are against us. And one of the big problems we have had is we actually have not been able until relatively recently to even start monitoring biodiversity um, at a global level. But biodiversity monitoring has, of course, been going on for decades, um, but there have been lots of problems with it. And these on this slide are some of the problems. First of all, we have very biased uh, uh, data, uh, databases geographically. Uh, so countries like this, the Netherlands, United States, uh, France, whatever, uh, ha have very good coverage compared with the majority of the world. Uh, data sets also tend to be biased towards terrestrial ecosystems. We are inescapably terrestrial as a species, and so we tend to look at things terrestrially. Um, and so other, um, other biomes in the aquatic and uh, marine systems uh, tend to be more poorly documented, and uh, the data tend to be less good. Um, and then within, for various reasons, within terrestrial ecosystems, our data tend to be better for uh, forest ecosystems than they are for various other, um, uh, 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 other ecosystems, uh, other terrestrial ecosystems. And then finally, we have um, huge taxonomic biases. So, so we have much better data on things like birds and mammals than we do on soil nematodes or algae. And, um, and of course, uh, it's extremely questionable that birds and mammals are good indicators of biodiversity as a whole, or even that any taxonomic group is. So these are the sorts of things that have been going on for decades. These are um, showing migratory bird declines in the, in the UK, and you can see everything's um, on a strong march towards zero. Uh, you could have come up with a smaller number of species that got upward trends as well, but this is an example of um, the sort of data sets that exist in a data-rich country like this. You cannot do this for most of the world. Um, in the UK, we can even monitor fungi. Look at that. Um, but um, a couple of things transpired really to help us start to, start to get our act together. We haven't got it together yet, but to start to get our act together on developing global data sets and global indicators for biodiversity monitoring. The first was the 2010 biodiversity target of the, of the Convention on Biological Diversity. The governments agreed this in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2002, and then of course it became immediately apparent that there was absolutely no way of measuring it at the time. Um, and the, um, the second thing that really helped to, uh, uh, catalyze the tools um, for doing this is what uh, Bob spoke to us about, which is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, because that was the umbrella under which a lot of the uh, hard thinking was done to develop a lot of indicators and pull together data sets. And these, um, these data sets here have all come together um, uh, so that they can be used more or less globally now um, over, the, over the last 10 years. You have the IUCN Red List Index, which I'm uh, particularly involved in, but you have others like the Living Planet Index, which uh, WWF, I see Glyn Davies here, and, um, and uh, um, Zoological Society of London and others uh, have been running for a long time, but in more recent years, we're able to look at, look at the data globally. We have the water bird population index based on uh, wetlands international data, um, uh, marine trophic index based on fisheries data, and then we have various um, uh, habitat extent um, indices, coral reef condition, extent of protected areas, and, and we make use, obviously, of the world database on protected areas. Uh, run out of the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center, in which IUCN is also a partner, um, and various others. And so these are new data sets um, uh, that have grown up in the, in the last decade. Um, and as a result of this, we are, we're actually able now to, 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 to start monitoring things. This is one of the famous slides from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, looking at, at past, um, uh, present and future extinctions. 
just to show you just to, <clears throat> from the red list index, because this is what I work on and it's the simplest of all indices because if your taxonomic group scores one, then everything is completely unthreatened and if it scores zero, everything is extinct. And, um, and, and, and you've got the various IUCN categories in between. So if you look at birds, you see a, a slight downward trend and, and, uh, and that trend is actually leveled off somewhat because of conservation action. So we can actually measure something. Remember, this is an indicator measuring extinction risk. It doesn't measure everything we're concerned about in biodiversity, and no indicator does. That's why we need a suite of indicators. Um, look at amphibians, rapid decline and much lower down the scale. Mammals in between and uh, corals, well, that's the story of ocean warming um, in the last um, um, uh, uh, 20 years. Um, we can look at things not just over time, but we can look at them at single snapshot in time. So this is different taxonomic groups on the IUCN red list, and the more red you have, the um, more threatened you are, the more green you have, the less threatened you are, the more grey you have, the more data deficiency there is in there, and you can just see the various groups that we've worked on so far, resturgence, cycads, amphibians, sharks and rays, reforming corals being the most threatened, all the way down to sea snakes, birds and wrasses, which are the least threatened looked at so far. And you can see that the difference between these groups is massive. We can also look at how, um, and this is stuff we definitely couldn't have done 10 years ago, we can look at um, do a map like this, and this is actually 2004 data, so it's changed quite a bit since. These are the parts of the world where we have seen very negative trends on the amphibian red list index, and uh, where it's green, that's habitat um, loss of habitat, where it's blue, that's uh, over-harvesting, over-utilisation, and where it's pink, that's what we call enigmatic declines, which we now believe are due to the fungal disease, uh, chytridiomycosis, which is, and that has spread a lot since then. Now, all these various indicators and, and others I haven't had time to mention were pulled together for the monitoring the CBD uh, 2010 target published in Science Magazine last year. We had state indicators, pressure indicators, response indicators, and actually, bottom right, very few benefit indicators. Uh, so the actual monitoring of ecosystem services is really in, in its infancy. infancy. And pulling that together, and all the statisticians did wonderful things to amalgamate indicators. And as a result, you see the state going down, we see pressure going up rapidly, and we see our response to, um, uh, to the pressures levelling off. This sort of matches other, other talks we've, we've had. And levelling off, especially since we set the 2010 target, which is a little strange. Um, and, uh, and, of course, that mismatch between pressure and response is what's driving the decline in state. Um, the, um, we've been trying to do some work on um, monitoring conservation impacts. Have we actually had any impact? Because, of course, all that stuff I've shown you before is incredibly depressing. And, um, and so we came up with one method that we published in Science last year, um, uh, looking at what would have happened uh, for the conservation of birds, mammals, and amphibians, for which we have the best data um, in the absence of conservation action. And you can see the red lines there show that for birds and mammals, things would have been worse. Now, actually, the, the way we measured it was the way we were able to measure it with our current tools. We're actually working on a better methodology, which will, I think, show that conservation has had a bigger impact than, um, than we can currently measure. But already, even on, on a very crude method, we can demonstrate at a global level conservation impact for birds and mammals, and we cannot for amphibians. Um, and there's a reason for that, no time to go into it. So very quickly, some lessons learned. Um, the, um, so the, the um, development of all these new indicators actually made it possible to measure what happened with the 2010 target. And that, uh, so in an eight year period between the target being set and it actually being delivered, the world actually got its act together and we were actually able to measure it at a certain level. Um, and they're now being used for the MDG7 um, and they are now being huge um, uh, negotiations, discussions going on to fine tune and develop new indicators for the 2020 targets. See, I've got a minute left, so I'll be as quick as I can, but I can't honestly go at Bob Watson's speed. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, and they have uh, attracted a lot of attention at, um, uh, um, uh, among policymakers and in the scientific community. Um, 
uh, we've made uh, um, a lot of progress in reducing the biases and increasing global, global coverage. Um, uh, but we have a huge challenge in monitoring ecosystem services at a global level. One key thing to understand is nearly all the indicators we can do globally are based on data sets that are put together that were put together for other purposes. They weren't put together for these indicators. People have dreamt up all sorts of great indicators, but if you don't have a data collection system behind them, they remain academic. Uh, there's very poor budgeting and financing of biodiversity monitoring. That's sort of saying what I just said. Um, uh, and I was asked the, lastly asked to say, I'm just about to stop, this is the last slide. Um, uh, it's, um, do the indicators have any impact on biodiversity trends? Um, I think they certainly have in, um, in, 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 in some cases. We have to be a little bit careful here because some of these indicators are sampled indicators. And if you concentrate your um, conservation action on the sample, then your sample is therefore, this Goodhart's law is no longer representative of what it was supposed to be representative of and your indicator becomes worthless. Um, so, 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 we, so we have problems like, like, like that. But I think there's some evidence. But I have to say no evidence yet of serious policy changes based on the finding of biodiversity indices. That again bears out exactly what we've heard from other talks. Thank you very much.